Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Tonight is a, uh, a, a teaching message that we're doing. We'll be doing a news broadcast here for Israeli News Live a little bit later. Uh, we still have to run some of our uh, institute programming here on Israeli News Live because this is where you guys come to hear it. This is where most of the people that have subscribed, uh, 45,000 plus, but more than 20-something thousand were originally coming here for the different teachings. So we are looking at the two witnesses. Uh, it's a question that's been on a lot of people's minds. I've gotten a lot of letters asking me about why I make the stand that the bride or the the raptured church, I should say, will actually see the message of the two witnesses. So I hope the message tonight will bless you and help you in seeing a little bit deeper on this subject here. Let's quickly go. I've got a tremendous amount of information to share with you, so let's kind of go through this as rapidly as we possibly can. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, that is the keystone passages there for the two witnesses that we all are familiar with. We know it starts off with the measuring of the temple and the altar and them that worship therein. Uh, I've spoken about that, especially when we had the Temple Institute not too long ago speak about the plans, the, the blueprints for the third temple, uh, of this actually being a fulfillment or the beginning. Now, some people have said, Steve, this was actually done a couple of years ago. It's quite all right. It's still in the stage. It's still in the process of the fulfillment of Revelation 11. They said, take a reed likened to a rod, a measuring rule, in other words, to measure the temple and the altar and them that worship therein. Now, we physically get a worshiping in there, so we know that the third temple must be built. But, of course, it won't be just for the Jews. It's going to be for all nations. It's going to be the Vatican is going to fake their millennial reign in doing this to try to bring to pass scriptures that are not actually so. Anyway, though, we find out, though, that uh, the court that's on the outside is to be left out. It's left for the Gentiles, and they will tread that court for 40 and 2 months. And by the way, the 40 and 2 months, three and a half years, that is, we also find the two witnesses prophesy as well. Three and a half years, if you look at that as far as a uh, solar calendar, which the Jewish, uh, uh, the, the Jews of today go by a solar or lunar calendar. What's kind of ironic is that according to the Zedekite priesthood that was down in Qumran, they actually went by a, uh, a, a solar calendar instead of a lunar calendar. And they went by 364 days in a year, David writing his psalms, and there's actually 364 psalms in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, I always thought that was kind of interesting because it would be four days longer if you're looking at three and a half years, you got well a little over a dozen days there, maybe about 13 and a half days extra, or in the case of the fact that they're laid dead in the street for three and a half days, take off that timing and you end up with about nine days left. Well, if you take a look then scripturally, what applies then according to the, I believe it's in the book, of, it's either the book of Enoch or, or the, um, the book of... Um, the Apocalypse of Abraham, one or the other there, it talks about the different things that will transpire on the earth when God brings His judgment. And actually, this is when He hides His bride. It's before the wrath of Almighty God falls on the earth. Now, I didn't prepare that particular scripture because I have so much to deal with here. Anyway, verse 3 says, I give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. These are the two olive trees which stand at the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth found in the book of Zechariah, of course. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. I've never believed that's a literal fire per se, uh, out of their mouth, I mean, but like Elijah. Elijah said, if I be a man of God, when the soldiers came up there, he said, let fire come down and consume you. And he did exactly that. Now remember, Jesus' own apostles wanted to do that when they were coming after him. He says, should we call down fire out of heaven and devour them? And Yeshua says, you don't know what spirit you are of. They were trying to apply something for an age yet to come. And I wonder if God is not going to stay the wrath of some of these nations off of Israel during the time of the ministry of the two witnesses by stopping these military mites with that type of uh, of ministry through Elijah bringing that back. Now, some people say, well, you Steve, you say Elijah, we agree with you, but we think it's Enoch, or some people actually say John, and 
I could tell you some things about John if you really wanted to know the truth on it, but I don't think many people can handle the truth as it is. It's, it seems like too many people have itching ears and don't really want to know what the truth is to begin with. But when it comes to Elijah, uh, yes, I do believe it's Elijah, but when it comes to Enoch, no, I don't believe it's Enoch. I believe it's Moses because many reasons behind that. One of, though, in, in this case here, they have power to turn the waters to blood, just as Moses did. Very clear sign of his ministry. Now, those that say that it's Enoch are going to automatically tell me, well, Steve, no, you're wrong on that because the Bible says it's appointed once for man to die and after this the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9. In fact, that's found in verse 27. And it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. And so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look unto him for shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, to save time, I'm not going to read to you the entire chapter there. It's not very long, though. But if you were to just back up and read that entire chapter, you will find out the whole premise of this chapter is dealing with how many times does the Messiah have to come and die. And no, as the sacrifice, he was to come only once. Now, when I say sacrifice, many of you guys already know my thoughts on this right here. He was the Lamb of God. I do agree with that 100%. But the thing is, we're also, he's also looking for the sacrifice of your praise and worship. He did come and died. He did, according to the book of Adam and Eve, he paid that price in order to redeem back the lost man. All right? So we'll hold that there. Anyway, as far as Messiah, though, keep in mind, what does he do? This whole chapter here is dealing with the fact that the man that's to die once is the Messiah. It has nothing to do with any other person. If it did, then you couldn't say that, what about the case of, uh, of uh, the man that Jesus took uh, Lazarus and raised him from the dead after he'd been dead for four days and rotten and in the grave? He had to die a second time. Well, I thought it was appointed only once for man to die, then after this, the judgment. Well, he didn't go to a judgment, and yes, he did come back and died a natural death later. Now, some would argue, well, he know he never died the second time. Well, that's nonsense. Yes, he did. And then again, we have all the other many, many cases of people that have died and been raised up. And even in Jesus' own ministry, we have people that died and were raised from the dead. Even Paul fell off the wall, or a man, excuse me, a man in Paul's ministry fell off the wall and was uh, supposed to be dead there and, and prayed for him and raised him up. So how many times do all these people have to die? Not to mention modern times, all the people that have died have been raised from the dead. And I've known cases where not just a few minutes, but hours on end had been dead and raised back to life again. So it, you have to look at the scripture for what it says. All right, let's continue on though. So they prophesied during this time. They bring about all kinds of plagues, etc. And one thing I want you to keep in mind, because we'll touch on this somewhere along the way on this particular broadcast, says in verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and, and nations shall see their dead bodies, because they're going to be killed, and they lay in the street three and a half days, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they, shall, they, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So it rules out the idea that the two witnesses are the Old and New Testament, or Jew and Gentile. They're going to be dead, and they're going to lay in the street, and then they're going to be raised. And by the way, they're the two last people to be raised from the dead. This is where the rapture part comes in. So anyway, this is kind of setting the stage. Like I said, we'll save time there because we have a lot of scriptures to go through. So we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is our next stop here in the Bible. And uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I want to take you to verse 15, starting with verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. All you guys are familiar with that, aren't you? By the word, how many though know that the word remain actually in the Greek language means survive? How many people do? So, in reality, it should read that we which are alive and survive unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, Jesus plainly said 
there are none that are dead in God, in Christ. They're all living. And then, of course, we know the story. They made fun of Jesus and said, you're a man are 50 years old, and, and, and Abraham is dead, and, and all the other prophets are dead. No, they were not dead. They were alive in another dimension, and this is what Jesus was trying to bring out. So when it says right here, the dead in Christ shall rise first, there is only two men on the face of the earth at that time that will be dead because the rest are alive in Christ in another dimension waiting for the resurrection so that they can come back as well. But the ones that are dead in Christ are the two witnesses. Now, some might be happy. Praise the Lord. I get that. I see that, Brother Steve, but we're going to prove it. We're going to go much deeper, all right? Remember, the word remain actually means survive. Those that, those that are alive and survive unto the coming of the Lord, right? Now, verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, that young man, Brother Nathan, that we did the video on just recently, it's actually had many, many views now, well over 100,000 views, by the way, I have gotten several emails uh, claiming that his family has been wanting videos about him removed. Uh, they're, they're, I, I don't know this for, for certain. I have sent email back saying if this is the family's request, at least direct me to where I can contact them. I want to confirm it. If that's so, I will definitely honor the request. But there's many people that have said they do not believe this young man's testimony. I do refute that 100%. And I know why people, especially in some Christian circles, do not accept this young man's testimony. It's because it steps on their doctrinal beliefs. And I'm not interested in doctrinal beliefs. I'm interested in what the Word of God says. And different issues that they have. One, they say, well, he's for works only. Uh, well, he sees Jews in heaven, and they didn't accept Jesus Christ, so they have to all be damned and gone to hell. That's another idea that people have. Uh, all kinds of different nonsense ideas. But let me explain something to you. The Bible says in, in the book of Revelation, I forget the chapter and verse where it's at, but it speaks about the souls of them that are under the altar, that are crying out, Lord, how long do you have to, until you avenge our blood on those upon the earth? This is the Jewish people that have been murdered down through the ages ever since. Because you have to remember, Yeshua said when he was here on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. If he said they're pardoned, then bless God, they are pardoned. If a president of the United States can pardon a turkey on Thanksgiving that don't need pardoning, by the way, if anybody needs pardoning, it's the president himself. If anybody needs pardoning, it's the ones that ate the turkey or killed the turkey because the Bible says don't kill them, all right? So the turkey don't need a pardon, but if, nonetheless, if the president can pardon, let's say not a turkey, but a person that's guilty of a crime and the man can go free, how much more then can Yeshua pardon someone that has done something wrong? All right, so if he pardoned them, brother, they're pardoned. And for anybody to try to, I dare you to take the sins and try to place it back on somebody that Jesus Christ has pardoned. All right, he pardoned them right there with his own blood. You know, uh, when I say the blood, what I mean as far as that is, I mean it's like taking a, taking, taking a pen and writing it itself because he was sitting there dying and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the Word of God says in the Old Testament there that if a man doeth something and do, does not know that he's doing wrong, will not the Lord consider it? Surely he will. Surely he will. All right. So anyway, they were, they, I believe that the pardon was real. Now, since that time, though, their eyes have been blinded, according to Yeshua and according to Paul, and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. You can find that in Romans chapter 11 under Paul's side. I forget exactly where it was, where Yeshua says it. But that's stated there. All right? So now, their eyes are withholding, but they're that souls that are under the altar. And that's the Jews. People are saying, well, where were the Christians at? You know, Paul said he went up to the third heaven. There's more than one level of heaven. The young man says that. He speaks about that. All right? He speaks about this Messiah that he said, I mean, okay, they said, they, they say, he says in there, you know, that once he repented, he never had, an, he never had sin on, on his life. Now, I think maybe he was coached by the rabbis to say the part when he repented. But he clearly made the statement that he had no transgression. None. All right? He said, you'll be surprised. He said, many people around the world know him, 
but they'll be surprised when they find out who he is. This is why I think his parents want it down, because he's, he's telling that the Messiah is Yeshua. It's plain as day. He don't have to say the name. He's saying it. Even if the boy didn't know it was Yeshua, he still had that revelation of who it was. All right. Secondly, he sees these two people rise up from the dead. And when they rise up, the mountain separates. Well, when the two witnesses rise up, there's a mighty earthquake and 7,000 people die as a result. All right? So what this young man saw, to me, is biblical. I don't care how many people want to twist what he says, and, and no doubt, maybe in the coaching from the rabbis and stuff, that may be so. Again, though, I've heard it said that they're wanting to remove videos that he was in. And if that be the case, they contact me, let me know this, or somebody direct me where I can actually contact his parents to verify that this is so, I will honor that for the sake of the family. I do appreciate that, and I, and I would not want to dis, dishonor the family's desire if that is the case. So anyway, if you happen to know the family, let me know. Uh, I know I've had one sister that has contacted me and told me this, and I just simply said to my sister, because I do love the sister dearly, I said, you know, direct me to them, direct me to the one. I, I want to see this for myself. I don't want hearsay. I want to see it for myself. Uh, and it may be, too, because some rabbis may not like the fact of what I've said. And, you know, you never know. So I want to know these things for, for, for my own heart's sake. All right, so we move on there. As I said, we see in, uh, uh, in First Thessalonians, we see the, this rapture. And it's the people that survive unto the end. Now, that's really heartbreaking. And believe, believe me, if I could get a rapture uh, at the beginning of what we call seven years or, or mid or whatever, the earlier I can get it, if I could get it 20 years before the end, I would love it. But I, 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 you know, and I've always believed it too. It would come before the seven years, but slowly but surely, God has been dealing with my heart on things, and I'm seeing things that I need to share with you as well. Do I believe in a rapture? Yes, I do. Okay, so it's not that I don't believe in a rapture. I just want you to see some things. All right, now going from there, I need to also take you to Matthew 24, because. What we just read there, there's a very important passage there in Matthew 24. And, of course, we know the famous uh, dissertation that Yeshua gives in Matthew 24. They ask him about the things that are going to happen before the end comes, and he gives all these examples. But there's one particular part here because it says here in 1 Thessalonians, in verse 16, it says, when it speaks about the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, all right? Uh, also, the part going back up to about the remaining. For this we, we say unto you, verse 15, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Again, I believe that that asleep are the two witnesses. All right? Now, I know it says he will bring the dead with him. Well, where are their spirits at? They're with him. Now, I don't just say it's just the two witnesses only, but the only ones that could literally be dead at that moment are those that are asleep. In other places, it says dead. And even when it comes to asleep, remember when, when uh, Lazarus was dead, Jesus said, I go wake him, he's asleep. And then he says plainly, he's dead. But I keep bringing to your memory because I want it to stick now. Remember this, though. Jesus says he's not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. See, when you're in Christ, there is no death. You know, now this particular case here, their bodies are laying dead in the street. They're asleep, like Stephen was asleep. So I believe it's speaking of them. And this is something the Lord revealed to me about a year ago. I brought this out already. All right, let's go to Matthew 24, though. I want to bring another thought for you here. Now remember, Jesus speaks about wars and rumors war. Verse 6 there. And, and nation shall rise against nation, verse 7. And all these are the beginning of sorrows, verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. We see that in verse 9. Verse 10, and shall many be offended. I'm just roughing these out, okay? Offended. Uh, and shall betray one another. Now, we're seeing that in our ministry like never before. You want to talk about being betrayed, we've had some major betrayals. And I've not said a single word about that, but we have. It has some very serious issues there. Many of our own people in our own ministry contacted secretly. In fact, if you were contacted secretly, I, I would love to know about it. You can email me, stephenbenoon at aol.com. Uh, and verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13, here is the clincher. 
but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Wait a minute. He that endures unto the end, shall be, the same shall be saved. That's what it says right here also in 1 Thessalonians. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain or survive, the real Greek translation for this word is survive, that are alive and survive unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Even that young man, when, when that mountain, when those dead rose up and that mountain opened up, the Mashiach stood there and the whole world knew it was the Messiah. And they were entering in. I think it's just a dimension. Just like when we, because this is, the, by the way, this is the same place that Jacob goes and sees the ladder and he sees angels ascending and descending. Hello, people. Wake up. I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not here to play church, guys. I'm serious. You know, and one thing, let me tell you something. I love you guys with all my heart. And, and I get a lot of people that speak against me, especially more so now. But God deals with me on a regular basis, revealing things to me. You guys, you know that. You see that. But I can't sit here and baby people either. You know, we're in a, a majorly serious hour. I'm watching, like I said, you read right there in Revelation, or Matthew 24, the things that Jesus said are going to happen. We're seeing it happen. We see the nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And now you're going to see some more things that are going to come to pass here before too long. You know? I've really, and I can't say there was a rabbi that prophesied in the 1700s that Russia would attack, uh, that will, will strike Turkey. I, I believe that very well may happen. Even that young man said that Russia and the United States and NATO and their allies would go to war with each other for about two weeks. Watch what happens there. Now keep in mind though, even on that young man's timeline, I will say this here. I believe he's seeing those timelines and gaps. I, when he looked at it and figured that it's all going to end up in a few months, I don't think it was literally like that because I'm watching biblically what happens here and I still think it's a, a few years, but we're going to see it in stages because it takes time for them to get troops in there. And by the way, we'll see it on the news tonight, Germany sending 1,200 1, troops. Getting interesting, friends. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's go there next. Another interesting passage here for the rapture. And we find right here, it says here in verse 52, verse chapter 15, verse 52, And a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hmm. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality... Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Again, another rapture message. I agree, 100%. You ever look, though, at the verse that he quotes right there? Do you know that's from Isaiah chapter 25? Let me take you to Isaiah chapter 25. I think you might be interested. Something the Lord revealed to me tonight as I was preparing, after three days of preparing this, the Lord revealed something to me that is just astounding. And it goes with that rapture passage there in 1 Corinthians. Because he says, Thus will come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. If you go to Isaiah chapter 24, let's begin with verse 3. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do languish. That's all these wars and nations that are rising against nation. This is where a lot of these things are happening that we're seeing and are about to see even more. And as the Bible says, it's the beginning of sorrow. Friends, it's going to be a very hard time in the coming months ahead, in the next year or so. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. That's the leaders. Pope Francis and his crusades that he's on. Now Putin trying to rise up against him. Going up against NATO, the, the, the Pope's forces there, under the Russian Roman 
or the Russian Catholic Church, Orthodox Church. It's all fighting in the name of the Lord, Yeshua. They, fight, they, they claim they're fighting in Jesus' name. You know, that's what Jesus says in the lost gospel. He said, they will war in my name. That's what they'll do. That's found, I think, in chapter 61 of the humane gospel. Anyway, verse 5 says, The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Can you imagine that? that wait a minute now. Hang, hang on, guys. I, you, I don't want you to miss this. All right? I'm actually in the wrong chapter. We're going to come back to that one. That one's on my list, too. It's the next chapter over, chapter 25. My apology. Chapter 25, we're going to be going to verse 8. We'll start at verse 7. Um, that, that does set the stage, though. I guarantee you that. It does set the stage. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. What? The veil is upon all nations? Verse 8, he will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth for the Lord hath spoken it. Now, according to 1 Corinthians here, the writer here, Paul, I believe is who they attribute this to. He gives you the rapture. They're going to be changed the moment in the twinkling of an eye. The dead are going to rise first. See? The dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this is corrupt and must be put on incorruption. Then you get down there to verse 54. He says, and as, as uh, uh, it's come to pass, then, then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, most people would think that was when Yeshua came and died and raised up. That's when death was swallowed up by victory. Not according to this. This clearly says that it, the death is swallowed up in victory when the last two dead people are raised up. And that's Moses and Elijah. When their dead bodies are laid in the street three and a half days, according to Revelation, they're the two last people to die on this earth that'll be raised up. Now, not the two last are going to die. I'm talking about the two last dead people in Christ. We're not talking about the rest that are going to die that'll raise up at the end of the millennial reign for judgment. All right? Now, so he says that's, he says that's when the scripture is fulfilled. So what does it say here? You got to read verse 7, though. That's important. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil and it's spread over all nations. By the way, the covering cast is also the word veil in Hebrew. And it's healed. Now, let, let me tell you what it really says here. Gosh, praise be to God. You, you guys need to see this as well. Uh, because I, there's some things in Hebrew here I need to share with you, and I want you to be able to see it. So, just bear with me here, and I'll try to get my big head out of the way for a minute. Um, let's go back to the Bible there. We're going to go to Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 25. Got to get the lights changed, because once we do that, we lose the we lose good lighting and stuff. All right. Now, Isaiah 25. We're going to go down to verse 8. I want you to see this here. Verse 7. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering. All right. That is cast over all peoples and the veil that is spread over all nations. All right. I'll call Hagoim. See? That veil, Vehamasaka, Seka, Secha, excuse me, Vena Sucha, Al Kol Hagoin. When Yeshua died, didn't the Bible say that the veil was rent from the top to the bottom? Do you know what that veil actually represents? 
The holy of holies is where the human heart is. It's your understanding. When the veil was rent and that was open, their hearts were open to who he was. Only those that could believe. But according to this scripture here, we can see that, that they still were blind. Watch verse 8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will he take away from off of all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. The reproach of his people, he will take it away from off all the earth. My brother, sister, it, and we're not just talking about the Jews here, by the way. We're talking about Jew and Gentile is veiled. No wonder why Yeshua said that Elijah, Elijah must restore, return and restore all things. Yeshua did restore all things, but what happened? Then they, they got a hold of it at Nicaea Rome and they perverted everything back all up again. And now the Bible, they got everything all mixed up as far as in doctrines today and the churches and everything else. And nobody knows what's truth anymore. The veil is back upon the people's face. They can't recognize who he is. People don't know who Yeshua really is. Instead, they got the Methodist version, they got the Baptist version, they got the Pentecostal version, they got the United uh, Presbyterian version, the United Pentecostal version, they got uh, this group and that group and this cult and that cult and JWs and Jehovah's Witness, I mean there, and the, uh, uh, the Mormons and, and the Seventh-day Adventists and, and you, uh, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different doctrinal ideas out there. And you think they're right? Well, everybody thinks, well, my church is right. Bless God, we got, we got the truth. Praise the Lord. We got the truth, brother. Or they might say, I got my eyes open. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. Your eyes are open when, when you start seeing what this is showing right here. When you can begin to recognize the true word of God for what it is. And God says the two witnesses bring that. All right, so he says, and he will destroy. Let me read it to you from King James Version because that's what most people are reading. All right. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death and victory and the Lord God will wipe away the tears off of the faces and rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth and the Lord hath spoken it. See, there's his people is separated from the goim. All right, and by the way, that clearly says right there in the Hebrew language. Uh, um, let me get it up here again. Go back to where I left off at. Uh, in verse eight, there. There we go, right there. It's if you look there on your screen there, where you can see people there on verse eight there, right next to the Hebrew Amo, his people. That's what Amo is. His people, and at the uh, where it says over all nations in the bottom of verse 7, al kol chagoim, that's the nations. That's the Gentiles. So see, they're both veiled. Yeshua says the Gentiles are veiled as well. No wonder why the Bible says that the ten people of the nations will take the hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, show us your ways. We hear God is with you. It's not that the Jewish people with the Torah have it right. No, sir. It's because the two witnesses have come to restore his word. All right, now, let's move on, though, quickly. If you go to Joel chapter 2, verse 13, another passage I want to share with you real quick here. If you saw all the different notes that I have here, it, it would just blow you away. I've got, I've got so many notes here in the Bible preparing this message, I, 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 it's hard for me to keep them straight. All right, Joel, verse, chapter 2, verse 13. And it says, I'll start at verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. I told you, I said, the Lord had been dealing with me. The veil is over the people's hearts. Their hearts are hardened. See, rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and a great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. 
Yeah, this is the reason why the two witnesses are wearing sackcloth and ashes. They're coming a time of mourning when one, Israel, Zechariah 12, recognizes that the Messiah is Yeshua. And secondly, they come with sackcloth and ashes. Why? Because their hearts are in. The veil has been torn. And their hearts are open to be able to show. See? Rend your heart, not your garment. All right? All right now. We're going to go now to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Another one here. And this is one that many of you guys are familiar with because we know that when Moses was on the earth, Moses had to put on a veil. He had to veil his face from the people. And that veil is still over the face of the people today. The people really don't know what Moses said. You really don't know what Moses taught. You don't really know nothing about Moses and what he really brought. Yeshua came and even tried to correct some of this, but they also tried to hide a lot of what Yeshua said. Yeshua tried to come and restore. You know, think about it. When, when you read the book of John, the gospel of John, what is, John keeps talking about the commandments of the Lord. What commandments is he talking about, friends? You need to think about these things. All right? Chapter 3, verse uh, 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall... Turn to uh, when it shall or when when they shall turn into the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And we see that about Israel, but according to Isaiah's prophecy, and this prophecy is according to a rapture prophecy here that says it'll be fulfilled at that time, that the veil is on the nations as well. Okay? Now, I want to take you. I, I said to you that Moses is one of those uh, witnesses that is actually coming. Let's go to, I want to take you to Exodus chapter 34. All right? Actually, let's go to Exodus chapter 15 first. I call these unfulfilled prophecies of Moses. One of those, and I'll just tell you this one real quick. Moses actually makes the comment. He asks the Lord. He says, they're going to ask me, Mashimo, what is his name? Moses says, what do I tell them? You know, that's in an, that's an Exodus chapter 3. Let me take you there real quick. All right. Let me see here. Am I in Exodus or no? Maybe, maybe I didn't go to Exodus. Oh, I didn't. I'm sorry. I went to, <laughs> went to Isaiah. Forgive me, guys. Uh, Exodus chapter 3. This is Mamre, uh, www.mechon, M-E-C-H-O-N, hyphen, Mamre, M-A-M-R-E dot org, by the way, those of you that want to um, follow along or would like to know where I read from on the Hebrew English version here. All right, and so it says here, Ve'yomer anochi elochai avicha. See, God says to Moses, I am the God, the God of your father. Your father. He's not talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you know why God says to Moses, I'm the God of your father? He wasn't sure if he was Jewish or not. That's the same issue in my own life. When I was born, I was given my sister's father's name. There's many people that know what that is. I normally don't speak about it because I did work law enforcement, did undercover work, and to me it's a risk for my family for that to be made public. But I was given his name. And then when I was 16, my mother revealed to me who my real father was. Ron Danoon. There's two Ron Danoons in the world, by the way. Ronald Vernon Danoon is my father. And I met my father when I was 26 years old. Now, my father, they, they had no idea they were Jewish descent. It was through my DNA test that also conclusively proved that my father was indeed, Ronald Vernon Danoon was my biological father, but it also revealed that my father was from a long line of Jews. And I used the name Benun because the Danoon family, all the, that were Jews, said that originally the name was Benun, and many of them restored their name back. So legally, I go by Benun as a restoration of the family name. This is who I really am. Not my sister's father. But I, I do have a respect for him as well because of his kindness in me as I grew up. Now, 
Moses, though, God had to deal with him on that first. He had to deal with him about his identity. So first God says to him, I am the God of your father. See? All right? Elohai Avraham, Elohai Yaakov, the Elohai, excuse me, Yitzhak, the Elohai Yaakov. I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob. All right? Now, we skip on down a little bit further there. God is talking with Moses. They're having a conversation back and forth. He's worried about the fact that he can't talk well. He's got, he's got a, a, a speech impediment of some sort. Uh, and then we get to verse 11 here. And, uh, and, and Moses says here, Moshe el And Moses says to God, Mi uh, here, who, who am I? Ki elecha el pao. Who, who am I that, that you would send me to Pharaoh? And that I should bring forth the children of Israel. And, and, uh, and he says, And God says, And I will be with you. And there shall be a token unto you. And he goes on to say, you know, he gives him the two signs. And uh, we, we move on down. And by the way, uh, the signs, though, have never been fulfilled either, by the way. Uh, yes, the turning of the staff, yes. But when God says to him, uh, oh, let me, before I get ahead of myself, let me go to verse 14. I'm uh, sorry, no, verse 13. Ve'yomer Moshe el chaylahim, and Moses says to God, Hine anochi, bo el b'nei Yisrael, behold, uh, when I come to the children of Israel, and I say to them that the God of your fathers has sent me, Elohim, to you, and they will say to me, What is his name? What do I say to them? Do you know that we can't find a single shred of evidence where the children of Israel ever asked Moses what God's name was? So I believe it's something that's got to be fulfilled. We also find out that when God says to Moses, if they do not believe the, the, first, the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Now that sounds almost, it sounds weird, God would say it. If they don't believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Wait a minute, the voice of the sign and the sign of the stick turning to a serpent and his hand turning to leprosy with a healing has nothing to do with the voice of a sign. Moses' message was that voice. So when God says to him, let me find that for you real quick. Right here, verse 18. Veshemu lakolach, see, and they shall hearken to thy voice and thou shalt come and thou shalt the elders. Wait a minute, I'm sorry, that's not it right there, hang on. Okay, to save time, I'll just, I'll just quote it to you. And he says to them, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. So one is definite, one is not so definite. God is saying to him, if they don't believe you, how would God say if they don't believe you, but they shall believe you later? Clearly in the biblical passages that we have about Moses, the children of Israel never believed Moses. In fact, God waited for that entire generation to die off because they did not believe Moses. So God clearly, when he says, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign, is speaking of a future ministry that Moses would have. All right, now, let's take a look real quick. Exodus 15, just quickly. Alright, then sang Moses, future tense, and the children of Israel this song, and spoke saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. Brother, sister, that's the Antichrist. And it's in the future. And it's one horse, one rider. It's in the singular, even in Hebrew, as it is in English. Not 600. You know, the Pharaoh of then will be a Pharaoh today. 
It'll be a man over a one world religion, religious and political system. As Pharaoh was over politically over his nation, he was also the God to his people. Yeshua says in the lost gospel there that there would be one that they will, that they will treat him as if he were a God. Let me see if I got that handy here in part of my notes here. I, I don't know if I do or do not. Um, just quickly looky here. Okay, no, I don't have it here. But anyway, he does speak about that there would be one that they, they, they make him a god. He said, but he's not a god. And it's actually, I do, I think I do have it, but I'm not quite ready to bring that part there. Let me, if I can just see it quickly. Um, yes, verse 4, chapter 61 of the Humane Gospel. For many shall the miracles of this strange God work in the earth, and the people shall worship that Savior which, with much devotion. Pope Francis is doing a really good job of that. And believe me, if that man dies and they get another one in, it'll be the same thing. It's no different. I don't, I don't care who it is that's there, whichever one it is. But I, I, I hold firm that I think, it is, I think it is Pope Francis. With much devotion for all hope rest in the God that is not a God, but deceives the people of every nation. But the eternal spirit of the all shall send forth his holy messengers. By the way, uh, chapter 61 here is identical to Matthew 24. And even Yeshua says in Matthew 24, when this gospel has been preached to all the nations, then the end will come. All right? And we find out in Thessalonians and in Corinthians as far as the rapture, if you survive to the end, when the dead in Christ shall rise first. So you're going to survive, if you're going to be part of that raptured group, you will survive to see the death of the two witnesses and them rising up. According to this right here, this strange God, the Pope of Rome, in my opinion, he's going to deceive the peoples of every nation. Every nation is deceived. They believe that he's truly, they, they, they treat him as if he were a God. What did, what did, what did the, uh, President Bush say when he was in office there before Obama? When they said, they asked him, what do you see when you look in the eyes of Pope Benedict? He said, God. The president of the nation saying that? He's a Pharaoh on earth. That's exactly what the Pope of Rome is. He's descended from this lineage. Especially Pope Francis, he's an Italian. Remember ben uh, Hadad, the descendant of Hadad, who was of the house of Esau, who was not killed by the sword of, uh, of, his uh, of David. He escapes, goes into Egypt, reared by Pharaoh, marries Pharaoh's sister's uh, sister, or excuse me, Pharaoh's uh, uh, wife's sister, Later goes into Syria, becomes the king of Syria. His son Benadad, which actually was a decent man, he's murdered. But later Esau's descendants end up in Rome, according to Obadiah's prophecy. Read the book of Obadiah. I wish we had time. We don't have time for it because uh, I know this is going to be a long message as it is. All right. Now, so anyway, we see, though, that Moses is going to fulfill it. One more, more, more passage, and this is in uh, chapter 34. And let me take you there here so you can see it on the screen as well because, again, it's another Hebrew issue here. Verse 10. Now, this is about Moses. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. Uh, I'm reading from King James. Such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nations and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Okay? Now, let's look over here. God says here, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. Okay? Neget kol amach. Now they say here, and even, even the Jewish people, the rabbis translate this as well, the same way, I will do marvels. Asu niflot. But that word is not marvels. 
It is wonders. The rabbis even admit they changed it to marvels because they said that Moses, how could he do anything greater? This is a prophecy in the future long after the crossing of the Red Sea and all the plagues of Egypt. And they said it had to just be marvels. In other words, what Moses did in the wilderness journey. No, God says he's going to do wonders. Now watch what he also says. He said, I'm about to do with thee. That is tremendous. Observe thou, thou which I am commanding thee this day. Behold, I am driving out before the Amorite, the, the Canaanite, Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee. Wait a minute. Now God just said, not only did he say he's going to make a covenant with him, that he's going to do wonders like never before. He's, in other words, never a wonder as big as this one. You didn't mean the parting of the sea? There's going to be something greater than the parting of the Red Sea? That's what God says is going to happen with Moses. And then he says right here, but be aware to yourself. Take, take, be, be aware. Don't make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee. He's talking about going to Israel. Do you not think that God ain't got enough brains to know that Moses has sinned when he smote the rock the second time and God wasn't going to let him in? God knew, God knew he was going to do it long before this ever happened. But yet God just made a promise to Moses that he'd make a covenant with him and he'd do wonders like he ain't never done before in all of his history and tells him not to make any covenant when he comes in the land. Why? Because it's in this day that this is going to happen. And believe me, you got people like John Kerry that would love to make a covenant with him. So would the Vatican. They'd love to make a co covenant to make peace. See, what is it? They're going to do like the Satan tried to do with Yeshua. Satan tried to get in there with Yeshua and make a covenant with Jesus and, and tried to get him and say, looky here, if you'll bow down and just worship me and everything, and everything will be all right. I, 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 I give you everything you want. God warned Moses, don't make that covenant. Now, let's move on quickly. I want to take you to um, Matthew chapter 17, verse 11. Okay? This is where we find Elijah is coming. This is right after the Mount Transfiguration. Elijah and Moses has already appeared to, to, to uh, the apostles. Yeshua there, he's transformed before them. Jesus tells them not to tell the vision to no man. Keep in mind, John the Baptist is already dead. And then they come along, and, and verse 11 it says, And Jesus answered, or excuse me, verse uh, 10 says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Or Elijah, that's Greek for Elijah. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that he, Elias has come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. All right? Likewise, shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake of them, of John the Baptist. That was when he was speaking about, but I say unto you, he's already come. If you look in the Greek language, the other part, he shall come and restore all things, it is all in future tense. Future tense and John is dead, John can't fulfill it. Why do we have to have a restoration? You have to have a restoration because something's not right. Malachi chapter 4. And I know that there's some groups that apply Malachi 4 to Elijah. They say came in this day. All right? And uh, uh, there's, there's several groups actually that do that. But I will say to you, I appreciate your thoughts. I've had many people share with me things about the different groups to say that, that, that they have Malachi for them. But you have to remember, in every one of the cases, the groups that have told me, and I'm talking about people that, that claim it from back in the 1800s all the way to the mid-1900s uh, of modern times here that claim that their Elijah was the one that fulfilled the prophecies of, of Malachi chapter 4. It's not possible. Okay? I don't mean to be hard on you, friends, but I'm just telling you it's not possible because when that Elijah comes, the earth is to be destroyed immediately after his, after his ministry. All right? 
Now, according to the death of the two witnesses that we find in Revelation 11, when their dead bodies lay in the street and when they resurrect, that's when Yeshua comes and his feet touch the ground. And that's when he pours out the plagues on this earth. And within that within about a 10-day period, everything is destroyed and the earth is burned up with fire. Man destroys himself. There's your Elijah of Malachi 4. All right? Now, Yeshua does, though, apply even in Malachi 4. He applies part of that to John. He actually, and I don't have time to show you where Yeshua does it, but it says, Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Yeshua applied that to John and stopped. But he doesn't apply the rest of it. And the heart of the fathers... Excuse me, and the, excuse me, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. John only was applied by Jesus of turning the heart of the fathers to the children. What was the father's hearts? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all longed to see the Messiah. So John showed the heart of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that wanted to see the coming of Mashiach. He introduced the Messiah to them. He made straight the path. In Malachi 3. But in Malachi 4, the second part of verse 5, or verse 6, and turning a heart of the children to their fathers, that didn't happen. That's what Elijah's going to do this time around. He's going to cause the Jews to recognize that indeed Yeshua is the Messiah. That's like that little boy said, Nathan, what did he say? He goes like this here. He said, then, he said that everybody will know then that he's the Messiah. He said, well, be, many of you will be shocked that it was him, but you knew, it, knew who it was all along. Oh, friends, praise be to God. All right. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Getting back into the, the prophecy that Yeshua spoke about here. I want to take you down to verse 36. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a, a little insight here, friends. A little insight. Let me, let, me, let me turn this off just for a second here so it'll be a little bit brighter here so not so dark. Matthew 24, as we've been seeing, many of these things have already been starting to fulfill. The nations are rising against nations, kingdom against kingdom. We're seeing the unrest in the Middle East. Things are definitely starting to gear up. But when we got down to the end of where Jesus talks about this, he says a very interesting thing, and this applies to the two witnesses, friends. This is why I want to get you to see. This is the part that's going to be hard for many people to take, this part of this message. But you've got to see a little bit of this so you understand where I'm coming from. Yeshua says here, verse 36 of Matthew 24, but of, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. I agree, I don't know the hour. I think we're close, but I don't know the hour nor the day. But as the days of Noah were, or Noe, as they say in Greek, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in, as in the days that were before the flood, he emphasizes it, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, most biblical scholars say, well, because I mean, all three things are natural. They're eating, they're drinking, and they're getting married. That's normal, right? Today, everybody eats, they drink, they get married. Or you can do it the other way. Get married, eat, and drink. However, however you want to put it. But Yeshua says this is a sign that's going to happen like it was then. Now, some scholars say, well, it was they were marrying for unnatural reasons. I agree with that. Then some people say, well, the eating and drinking, they were gluttonous. I agree with that too. But you know, I'm just a little bit more curious than some. I got to go see what they were eating and drinking. How do I know what they were eating and drinking? The only way I'm going to find out is go... Read the book that tells about what they were eating and drinking and what, and what the issue was about marrying. That's the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch, that according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, is part of the biblical canon. Okay? It, the book really exists. It is true. And we, they got an actual photocopy and they said that the book of Enoch that they, that, that was, uh, that was, that's been around ever since then, that, that is part of the Ethiopian Bible, is nearly identical. 
I haven't got to see an actual translation as of yet, but they said they're very accurate, very close to being the same. Now, I can't verify all of that, but that's what they say. So I went back to the book of Enoch and decided to see what is in the book of Enoch then. What were they eating and drinking, all, all these type things. In chapter 7, this is where we find this out. It says, chapter 7, verse 1, And they took wives for themselves. It's talking about the fallen angels, by the way. These are the angels that came down. They wanted to cohabitate with men. They left their first estate, and they come down to cohabitate with men. We find that in chapter 6. The leader of the 200 angels and all others with them, they came down, going into verse, chapter 7, verse 1, and they took wives for themselves. Everyone chose for himself one each. They were actually trying to keep the way God wanted it. One man, one woman. It's kind of funny. Fallen angels, they wanted, they, they're trying to keep some of it right. And they began to go into them and were promiscuous with them, and they taught them charms and spells. They showed them the cutting of roots and trees. They became pregnant and bore large giants, and their height was 3,000 cubits. These devoured all the toil of men until men were unable to sustain them. I want you to notice that. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, to be today. All right, so they, 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 they were eating and drinking. They were getting married. Well, we see the fallen angels married the daughters of man. There's a lot of marriages that are unequally yoked together, as we say today. Right? Now, what's interesting, though, the toil of men is from planting. Remember, we have to remember now, in, the, in Genesis, God had given man, this is a, a, the original perfect will for those that, and, and I know a lot of people don't like me talking about these things, but I've got to tell you this because we're, we're dealing with the two witnesses. And you got to see what Jesus said and we got to find out what was going on. So bear with me. It's not popular. A lot of people are against me because of these things, but I can only tell you what God's word says. And I'm not here to play games with you either. I'm here to tell you the truth, friends, because I do love you and I do care. All right? And those that want to run to 1 Timothy and like to grab, let's just deal with 1 Timothy. I'll tell you, I go through this every single time. What is it? 1 Timothy chapter 4. I believe that's where that's at. And so many people, they just go right there, you know. Um, and they say, you're teaching a doctrine of a devil. I'm like, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding. Here we go again. Now, because why? Timothy states here, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heeds to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats. All right? Well, let's, 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 we're going to go right as we go. I want to set it straight for you before we get into this other part right here. All right? Abstain from meats. All right? Broma is the word for food, not for animal flesh. All right? Abstaining from meats, which God hath created, all right, to be received. All right? With thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, then they say, well, okay, you said it's just food. But we, Steve, we'll prove to you that food was animals because all you got to do is go to verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. Here we go again. Kitzma. Kitzma is not the word creature. Okay? Uh, if you want to say that, you can, but it's every created thing. That's what it is. Every created thing. Of God is good and nothing to be refused. God created for us the plant life, every seed that brought forth of its kind, even the animals. By the way, we were both on the same, almost the same identical diet was man and animals. Now, I am a firm believer, okay, that God does not change, okay? I, I, and I would imagine many of you guys are the same way. You know, 
Because God says, I am God and I change not. That's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. All right? But when God changes not, he doesn't change his opinion or his thoughts. When he set up us a, a certain way to eat, he did it in Genesis. That's what he gave us, all right? So I'm just trying to bring that point out there to you, all right? Just, just to kind of settle that argument real quick-like. All right, now, so let's go back. Because we're dealing here with... Um, let me get back where we're at here. We're in the... Where was I at now? Okay, back, back, uh, we were looking at Noah, all right? That's where we're at. Sorry, I got, got sidetracked just for a minute trying to remember where I was at. Okay, so Noah says, according to what we have here, um, they were marrying these women, they were eating, they were drinking, so we want to see what they were doing there. They, they devoured the toil of men until men were unable to sustain them. And the giants turned against them in order to devour the men. And they began to sin against birds, against the animals, against the reptiles, against fish, and they devoured one another's flesh and drank the blood from it. Yeshua says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. As they were eating and drinking and given in marriage. What were they doing? It was unequally yoked marriages. It was fallen angels marrying daughters of God or the daughters of men. It was they were eating human flesh and animal flesh. It says plainly, they turned against them in order to, to devour men and they began to sin against the birds. They were eating birds against animals, against reptiles, and against fish, even the fish. And they devoured one another's flesh and drank the blood from it. So the drinking was the blood and the eating was the flesh. Then the earth complained about the lawless ones. Jesus says, as it was then, so shall it be now. And today, the same thing is repeating again. Even to the, the cannibalism, even cannibalism, not the fact God says that they sinned against the birds, against the fish, against the reptiles, against the animals, and they devoured them and ate their flesh. Okay? The two witnesses are coming, friends, to straighten this mess out. All right? That's what we... So, so we go back there. Now, now we can take and we can... Let's go to Genesis. And, I'll, and I want to put this one on the screen for you because you'll, you'll need this one here for sure. All right? We're going to go now to Genesis. Chapter 9. Because so many people get this mixed up. And I really, I'm really, I, I'm telling you, friends, I want you to understand. Because many people agree with me. They say, okay, Brother Steve, we agree. God did give a vegetarian diet in the beginning. And, and friends, I'm right there with you. I, I, I ate meat all my life. I was a hunter, everything. Believe me, I, I'm not trying to condemn you. And, I'm not, and I also, let me make this clear. I don't say you're going to hell or you're lost because you're doing this. Or because you don't recognize this. I'm only showing you that perfect will of God. And I'm showing you what the two witnesses are going to bring out. Bring out. Because we find their ministry. Because Jesus says here in Matthew 24. That when this gospel is preached to all the world. Then the end will come. What is this gospel part of? Part of that gospel that's going to be preached into all the world. Happens to be about what they were eating and drinking in the days of Noah. Okay. That's part of it. All right, now, we find out, says here, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh. And, uh, wait a minute, am I? No, I'm, I'm still in, I keep doing that. Sorry about this, guys. <laughs> I keep taking you all back to Exodus every time. Oh, gosh. Anyway, all right, Genesis. Let's get it right, Steve. Praise the Lord. Chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you, the dread of you, shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all wherewith the ground teemeth and upon all the fishes of the sea. And to your hand are they delivered. And most people jump right on that and immediately say, See there? We can do what we want to with them. They are delivered into our hands. That's true. 
But did God deliver them into our hands to kill them, to break his own commandment, thou shalt not kill? Or did he deliver them into our hands to care for them? And to love them. To do the way it was. Remember the bow and the, and the, and the sword shall be broke. And in, in, in according to I believe it's in Isaiah. And nothing shall harm nor destroy in all of my holy mountain. So see God is restoring back what he started in Genesis. He's going to restore back in the millennial reign as well. And you guys know that. You agree with that. I know you do. All right. But right here he says clearly. He's put them all into our hands. Now. Just like in the case of Matthew 24, when Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, I wanted to go see what they were eating and drinking. The same thing here. Why would God put, put the fear and the dread of them into our own hands? That is also answered by another book that has not been allowed to be part of the Bible, and I know why, because again, it, it, it straightens all this mess out if you wanted to know the truth. We have to go then to the book of Adam and Eve, the first book of Adam and Eve. And um, let me see if I get this in the right place here. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in, the wrong, I'm in the wrong spot here. Here we go. This is in the first book of Adam and Eve, and it st states here, O Lord, you created us and made us to be in the garden. And before I transgress, you made all beasts come to me, that I should name them. This is Adam talking to the Lord in, in prayer. Your grace was, was then on me, and I named everyone according to your mind. This is the way you're supposed to handle them when they're delivered into your hands. And you made them all subject to me. But now, O Lord God, that I have transgressed your commandment, all beasts will rise against me and will devour me. And Eve, your handmaid, will cut off uh, our life from the face of the earth. I therefore beg you, O God, since, that since you have made us come out of the garden and have made us to be in this strange land, will you not let the, will you not let the beast hurt us? When the Lord heard these words from Adam, he had pity on him and felt that he had truly said that the beast of the field would rise and devour him and Eve because he, the Lord, was angry with the two of them on account of their transgressions. Now it doesn't say that they would, but Adam was worried about that. Then God commanded the beast and the birds and all that moves on the earth to come to Adam and to be familiar with him and to trouble him and to not trouble him and Eve, nor yet any of the good and righteous among their offspring. Then all the beasts paid homage to Adam according to the commandment of God, except the serpent against which God was angry. It did not come to Adam with the beast. So when we look over here in the word of God here in Genesis, and God puts the, the fear of them, the dread of them into our hands, it's because Adam and Eve was fearing as well, and Noah, now that he was the only offsprings on the earth, no doubt, maybe like Adam, had the same type of thinking. You know, what's going to happen? Now, God brought them to him, and they paid homage enough to get into this ark for him. Okay? But this is why it says he delivered them into his hands. But he didn't deliver them to in his hands to kill them. Now notice what it says next. Now this is, let me read to you from the King James. And the reason I say that is because this is where a lot of people get the confusion from. So we go to Genesis 9. We're going to go to verse 3 in King James. What I have up on the screen is from the Mamre translation. But even in one verse there, it is totally messed up the way they translated it. So I'm going to tell you what it means literally so you can understand it better. In verse 3, it says, Every moving thing, after he says he delivers them all to their hand, he says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. And so everybody automatically assumes, Well, see there, brother, we can eat the animals now. That's when God changed the covenant from vegetarian to this. But he didn't change it there. The only time we ever see where God permitted the eating of the flesh scripturally was when the children of Israel lusted for blood and God allowed them to eat the quail. But then they were stricken with a plague. 
And you know, God, it wasn't that God just sit there and decided to try to kill all the children of Israel. The plague came as a result of eating the meat. Because not, we're not meant to that. And remember also, when God says to them, you're going to go to a land flowing with milk and honey, he never says anything about cows, goats, and chickens you're going to eat. He just said you're going to go to a land flowing with milk and honey. All right? Now, right here then, we see here, every moving thing that liveth shall be food for you. What does it say in the Hebrew language? Kol remesh ashachuchai. All right? Every creeping thing that lives. Lachem ichaye lachalu. Excuse me. Lachala. He's giving them every creeping thing for food. Bugs. In other words, things that don't have blood in it, he gives to them. Now, let's look very carefully, though, at verse 4. Now, according to King James, it says in verse 4, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. But flesh with the blood thereof, with the life of there, you shall not eat. Now, it's really not translated too bad, but the problem is, is it makes it look like, okay, just take the blood out and you can eat the flesh. That's not what he says. Let's look at it carefully. Now, according to Mamre, they translate it, only flesh with the life thereof, with the blood thereof, shall you not eat. That's not what it says. Akbasa, but flesh. Benefesho, with his soul, Demo, his blood, lotachalu, you shall not eat. Okay? Now I'll say it in English. But flesh with his soul, his blood, you shall not eat. Plain as day. All right? Now, in other words, if it's any kind of flesh, be it man or beast, if it's got a soul, it's got blood, you don't eat it. That's what God says. Plain and simple. You don't eat it. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? As it was in the days of Noah, when they were eating and drinking and given in marriage. What did, what did Enoch say they were eating and drinking? Humans, animals, reptiles, beasts, and fish, and drinking the blood thereof and devouring them. And he also said it was a sin. They sinned against the animals, the beast, the man. All that was a sin to do. And by the way, some people say, well, you know, even, even like when they say, well, you know, we take the blood out. When you make a pot roast, for example, and you cook it, what happens in a pot roast? Why does your water turn brown? It's the blood coming out of the pot roast, and it makes the gravy. And I used to eat that myself. You're drinking blood. It's exactly what you're doing. It doesn't necessarily mean that they just took and, and, and threw up the animal and gargled down the, the blood. If they cooked it, whatever they did, it drew the blood out. They were drinking the blood. Okay? Now, here's another way you know for sure what we're talking about. Go to verse 5. And then God says here to Noah, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Now you know that he's talking about what it was that Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and given in marriage. They were eating what? Human flesh and animal flesh. Now, Noah clearly identifies that right here. Remember, Noah saw what was going on. He was there before the destruction. And it says here, And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require, and at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. So, Okay, do you understand what he's saying here? In other words here, if you think that it's okay to eat flesh as long as it, you know, as long as you take the blood out, all right? It doesn't say that, but as long as you take the blood out, you eat the flesh. Well, in that case, you need the flesh, flesh of a human and the flesh of animals, if that's really the case of what he's saying. But when God clearly says, but flesh with his soul, with his, uh, with his soul, his blood, do not eat it. You do not eat it, period. And he says, your lives will I require at the hand of every beast and at the, and the hand of every man. Will I require even at the hand of every man's brother. So if you eat man or animals, God requires it at your hand. Now, he did get, you did get a permissive will. And that came in the time during when the children of Israel were in the wilderness journey. And by the way, when they were starving to death, 
Why were they starving to death? They had flocks and herds. Why didn't they just eat them? God gave them manna. Remember that? God didn't... The only time God gave them something other than bread and water, the natural staves of life, was when they lusted. And he permitted the flesh then. And plague struck them. I forget how many thousands died immediately. Why? Their bodies were not meant for doing this. And it's a major cause of health risk today as well. Look it up. All right? Now, we're getting close to closing, friends. Hmm. Okay, guys. Let's, let's finish this up. In chapter 7, verse 20, it says, For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. But they hearken not and incline incline their ear, but walk in the counsels of the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets daily, rising up early and sending them, yet they hearken not unto me, nor incline their ear, but hardened their neck, they did worse than their fathers. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken unto thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. Also Jeremiah says in chapter 7 verse 4, Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you truly amend your ways, your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood. You know, so many things, guys, we could say. We need a restoration. We need a restoration. And I know when the two witnesses come, they're going to restore back God's word that has been so brutally brutally uh, abused in this latter day. There's many notes I couldn't get to, friends. I know I've probably kept you way, way too long on this video anyway. God bless you, and I trust that this will be a blessing to you as well. If you believe that we are trying to serve God and to do His will, stand with this ministry. We do need your support. You can contribute online at IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. There's a way you can give there. If you prefer to mail in, you can mail in. If you need a bank number, we can always give you the routing number, etc., to be able to do direct deposit that way. God bless you, and we thank you for watching. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Shalom and good evening.